Hi, and welcome to Literary Hype. I am Stephanie, your Literary Hype Woman. Today's author conversation is for the historical fiction fans. Y'all know I love a good World War II novel, and this one is no exception. Uh, Kate Thompson's first kind of book that made it into America was The Little Wartime Library, and now she's back with another bookish World War II story, The Wartime Book Club. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with Kate Thompson. Welcome to Literary Hype. It is such an exciting day to get to have you on the show to talk about your new book, The Wartime Book Club, and your previous book, The Little Wartime Library. Um, So for anyone who hasn't seen The Wartime Book Club pop up on their social media yet, or heard about it from other readers, give us a little intro to what this book is about. Oh, okay. Well, firstly, Stephanie, thank you so much for having me on. I know you were a massive support around the time of the release of the Wartime Library. Um, And now here we are a year on. Where's that year gone? And we're talking about the Wartime Book Club. Um, So the Wartime Book Club is what I like to call a companion book to the Wartime Library. So it's not really a follow on, but it's another book um, set in a library in wartime. Um, but unlike Bethnal Green, which was under was which was um, you know besieged by Nazi bombs, in the Channel Island of Jersey, uh, the Channel Islands were the only British territory to be occupied by the Germans during World War Two. So, the librarians at St Helia Library didn't have to contend with Nazi bombs, but they did have to live under the heel of the Nazi jackboot. So, really, essentially, it's about these incredible librarians working under Nazi censorship, fighting censorship, trying to do what they could to get books to beleaguered, war-weary islanders, setting up a book club, sneaking um, books to Jewish people in hiding, and really understanding that in that awful time with all those Nazi censorship and rules and proclamations that, that really reading was like the last form of intellectual freedom that islanders still, still possessed And that is essentially is about what the book is about. It's about that love, indulging that escapism and that love of reading whilst living under this horrific sort of totalitarian regime. So it was something new for me, really, to to research this one. And this is based on a true story. So how did you come across it? Good, good question. All my books really are based on on true stories. And and like most of the, the stories that I find, I stumble upon them really by chance. And, and it can often just be one line or, you know, something you've seen in a museum or a book, and it just lodges itself like straight in your heart. So with the Little Wartime Library, obviously that came about through a very chance conversation with a 92-year-old East Ender, Pat Spicer, the sort of woman that you'd see on Call the Midwife, <laughs> um, who told me about this incredible underground library that she used during the Second World War. And in this case, with the Wartime Book Club, I was in Jersey. I was over there for the Jersey Literary Festival of Words in 2019. And I went to this incredibly evocative underground, uh, well, it used to be a bunker during World War II, and they've changed it into a museum. And I was walking around this museum, and it's dedicated to the occupation and, and what islanders faced and how they endured five years of living under occupation. And on the wall was this little tiny plaque, and it just said, dedicated to the to the people who worked in Jersey Post Office who unfortunately during the occupation we saw this scourge of poison pen letters so perhaps driven by hunger or spite or fear some islanders um informed on their neighbors so they would write letters anonymous letters are sent to the german commandant saying search the property of you know mr dark at belmont terrace he's got a hidden wireless and they sometimes they did it for money, but usually it was just a sense of spite. And quite often that was incredibly dangerous because the Gestapo or the, the secret field police would turn up at that person's house, search their property. If they found a wireless, that person would face um, deportation to a prison or concentration camp in Germany. So what would happen is that when these letters came into Jersey post office, the postal workers would steam the letters open. And then while they were cycling around the island on their on their rounds delivering letters, they would issue a warning, like you have 24 hours to get rid of that wireless or whatever in, sort of infraction of German rule had taken place. The next day they would date stamp the letter and send it on to German high command. And in doing this, this very sort of um, quiet act of resistance, they saved hundreds of lives. So there was just this tiny little plaque in the museum wall. I thought that's an incredible story. 
you know, I came, I came completely obsessed by the notion of postmen and women, you know, instead of delivering the mail, not delivering the mail and, and in doing so saving lives. And in tandem with that, I found out about the work that Jersey Library were doing, um, you know, delivering books to people in hiding. And I, I go, I became quite obsessed with this concept of quiet resistance. You know, what is it? Um, you know, it wasn't like in France where they were blowing up bridges and it was part of an organised network of resistance. That wasn't possible in in Jersey. The channel, you know, it's a tiny little island and they were completely besieged by the enemy. There was sort of one German to every three islanders, where in France it was one uh, one civilian to every 100 Germans. So it was a very intense period, but I love the thought of, of ordinary people behaving in extraordinary ways, like postal workers and librarians, and so that's what this book is. It's a, it's a celebration of that. And it's a love letter in the way that the wartime library was to, to librarians and to libraries. So this book is dedicated to a very special person. And you write about it a little bit at the beginning of the book. Talk a little bit about your, your 106-year-old buddy. Oh, my lovely BT. Yes. Yeah. BT Orwell is an amazing, or was sadly, an amazing woman. She was born on the 5th of the fifth 1917 and this was a woman I met when I was researching one of my previous books the Stepney Doorstep Society um and BT was just incredible you know she joined the anti-fascist party when she was 19 years old she stood up at this event called the Battle of Cable Street to fight the rise of fascism and was a very political figure in a time when it was very dangerous to be a Jewish woman living in the east end of London so I always, I just was amazed by the by the history that this woman had lived through. You know, it blew my mind to think I was sitting with a woman who had been alive during the First World War and we became great friends, BT and I. She always made me laugh. She had this big hooting laugh and she was just this larger than life character. And she had worked as a postwoman during the Second World War as well, as well as raising children and, you know, hiding from bombs and, you know, taking part in marches. She was this irreverent, subversive woman and I loved her dearly and she died very sadly just sh five days shy of her 105th birthday um, I've been to a 104th birthday party we thought we were going to make 105 and it was whilst I was researching this book so that's why I dedicated it to her because she is a woman who lived a rich and remarkable life and yet she's not really known and yet she deserves to be like so many wartime women Talk a little bit about your research process and how you find all these little details to include in the story. <laughs> I love the way when you say it's a, a research process, it makes it sound like it's quite organized. <laughs> it really isn't. <laughs> I think I just love what I love more than anything is sitting opposite somebody that lived through the war years and starting a conversation without knowing where it will lead. And quite often you sit there and you get that wonderful unfiltered like gush of social history and you uncover these incredible stories. Um, and, and Jersey is particularly rich for that. You know, it, it's like an island simmering with stories. So I used to go, to, when I went there, I had five research visits there and I would rock up at this place called Age Concern. I'm sure you've got a similar thing in America. And it's just a day club where people get together and play bingo or, you know, eat lunch and share stories. And, and I would just rock up there and sit with people and talk. And you just hear the most incredible stories that way. You know, people would once memory is such an in, intriguing thing, isn't it? And I think once people get together and then you get that back and forth and the bantering and the, that rich, lively reminiscing, suddenly the past comes to life and people would be sharing things all the time. And so that's where I I go to. That's like my first port of call, if you like, is to, is to go to men and, you know, to clubs like that. But then obviously I go to archives and libraries and and then go and do individual research. But that's my comfort place. Like that is where I'm absolutely happy just sitting, listening to that unfiltered gush and the back and the forth. And I, I, and I get the very strong feeling, you know, that, that we're a, a stage of history where the need to share is overcoming the desire to forget I think a lot of women and men in their 90s remembering the war years feel the need or, or rather don't feel heard. I think that I don't know what it's like in America, but I do feel we have this sort of feeling of loneliness, particularly in our elderly generation who feel that their memories and their contributions are often overlooked. 
you know, I interviewed this one wonderful woman called Eileen and she said, you know what? She said, I might have snow on the roof, but I'm not old. I've still got stories to tell. And I love that. I thought it's so true. So, yeah, that's where I always, whilst we have the opportunity, is what I'm saying, is to listen to these memories. I feel like we have a duty of care as a journalist but and an, and, and as an author to do that, to go directly to what historians call primary sources. But I just prefer to think of as just amazing, magnificent men and women. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that state that we're in with so many of these people that lived through the war didn't want to talk about it for so long. And now that they're dying off, now they want to talk about it and the importance of telling their stories while we still have the opportunity. Yeah, that's so true. It is so true. And I think for many years after the war, you, people just, and you can understand this, you know, they'd, they'd suffered five long years of privation and danger and fear and drudgery. And, you know, then the war ended and the welfare state came into being and everybody wanted to look towards a sort of bright, shiny future. They wanted to forget about the past and all those memories I tend to think of it as like they were all packed up in a suitcase and put under the bed. But you never can really, you know, I, I get the sense that for many people that survived the war years, a lot of them are suffering from post what we would call post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, for a lot of people having to process the most horrific things and never getting that opportunity to sit down and share their stories and feel heard, that that pain and that suffering, it doesn't fade, but it festers. And so all these years on, sort of 80 years on from the end of the war, we're beginning to get that that need to share is just bubbling up. You can't, it's like a, a sort of dam that you can't um, pat down. Eventually it's going to come out. And I feel that when I'm sitting with that generation, that bubbling out, that um, that gush of, of the need to share. Um, and it's interesting because we're not, and, and never is that more prevalent than in a place like Jersey, which because they lived with the enemy, unfortunately, the island was stained for a few years after the war by allegations of um, collaboration. They were in a very difficult position, the islanders. And, and so you heard these horrible terms that came up after the war. You know, women that had relationships with Germans were called jerry bags. And there were lots of accusations, some even from Winston Churchill, who said that they collaborated. And what I definitely found with my research is this absolute sort of paranoia at the way that they are perceived and treated and shame and the stigma and the persecution still swirls around that island it resounds in many quarters of the island but I definitely felt that they have been unfairly treated and that actually there were many a great many acts of quiet resistance as I call them or unorganized resistance that from islanders a lot of whom were just working class women doing what they could to strike back against the regime. And they've never really been acknowledged, like the, the librarians that used to supply books to people in hiding, like the post office that destroyed informers' letters. Those acts of resistance have gone undocumented. And I think it's time in history that we we take stock and we celebrate and we look afresh at history. You know, and I this is a novel, right? It's not, I'm not attempting to write a, a non-fiction revisionist history, but I think all good historical fiction addresses those things and tries to acknowledge social history and the suffering and, 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 you know, the contributions that men and women made to the sort of social, the economic, the political history of their areas. So that's what I try and shoehorn those messages in with the story. <laughs> and in writing about war, you're writing about a lot of really horrific moments in history. Mm. Mm. How do you put yourself in those moments to describe them? Cause you describe them dramatically and very <laughs> well but putting yourself in that moment to bring the horror of those situations to life? That's a really good question. And I don't think there's a really simple, straightforward answer to that. I think as writers and readers and book lovers, particularly those who have read from a very young age, I feel like we will have a heightened sense of empathy. I think it's our job as as journalists and authors to put ourselves in the shoes of others and or rather get under the skin of it. And the only way you can do that is with meticulous research, you know, read all the sources, read around it. But I also think then it then comes that extra layer of empathy that you need in order to understand what it's like to be sitting in an underground shelter, separated from your children and your husband, not knowing if your house is still standing that, you know, and, and, and understand the emotions that women lived through and, and what they what they saw and what they smelled and what they felt and what they heard. I think it's just a learning curve. As you get older, I think your sense of, certainly I've felt this, that as I age, my sense of empathy becomes more acute. I think we all 
I don't think I could have written these books in my 20s or my 30s. That's not to say everybody can't, but it's only now, now I'm, you know, turning 50 this year that I do begin to feel I have a heightened sense of empathy that enables me to write with more authenticity or more um, conviction. And 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 and, and I, one, of, one of the things I really, and I appreciate this as a reader, is that when you're reading a book, you want to be swept away. You want to feel what those characters feel. You want to see what they're seeing. You want to be on the street walking beside them. And I think that's our job as novelists is to pick people up and put them in that street, in that position next to them so that they're, they're it's all enveloping. Do you have any kind of rituals or anything that put you in the mindset of the 1940s while you're getting ready to write? So that's a really good question as well. Like when I interviewed Madeline Martin, uh, so I do a podcast called From the Library with Love. And, and I, I asked I ask other authors that question. And, and when I was talking to Madeline Martin, who wrote obviously the, the wonderful, written many wonderful books, but favorite of mine is the, is the last bookshop in London. And she listens to, she used to listen to air raid sirens going when she was writing and it got her in that moment. And I can relate to that. I definitely feel that that kind of gets you in, in the, the zone of it. For me, I like to write in the afternoons. I just feel like it's when my you know, the morning social media and catching up with emails and stuff. And then in the afternoon, my brain, it's like, you know, like me shake a snow globe and then everything settles down. That's how I feel come afternoon. I can just get into it. I get myself a strong coffee. I just try and absorb myself and forget about everything. Um, and music helps for sure. But really, it's just, a, it's. I don't think there's any magic bullet. I think you just have to sit your bum down and write words and keep on writing words every single day. When you're writing historical fiction, you've got to kind of cherry pick what you stay true to and what you kind of fudge a little bit. Yes. How do you approach making those decisions? I try to go on the basis of less is more, that sometimes you you might have spent all afternoon in an archive, um, but, but a light hand in the application of those historical facts, a sprinkling instead of a deluge is sometimes best. And I'll give you an example of how I've come to that conclusion. I read a review that, uh, for a book that I'd written previously. And, and in the review, somebody said, Kate Thompson has really done her research. And I thought, oh, that's good. You know, well, and then she said, doesn't she want us to know it? <laughs> and I was like, ouch. <laughs> but I did, you know, as painful as that is, I do think we can learn something from a bad review. In fact, I think we can learn more from a bad review than a good one. And so I've tried to try to apply that. And, and when I'm reading books, I appreciate a really concise fascinating nugget of history that I've never heard before just just weaved in effortlessly into the narrative rather than an information dump of lots and lots of facts and figures and statistics I think one well chosen or well crafted historical fact can have more impact you start each of these chapters with a book that was banned by the Germans and their explanation Um, talk about digging all that information out and if there was any one reason that surprised you more or a book that was most surprising that it was on their list? Um, I love a good chapter heading. I've got to, <laughs> I've got to say, anyone who's read the Wartime Library might realise that because I, in the Wartime Library I used real quotes. I, I interviewed 100 librarians to celebrate 100 years of Bethnal Green li- Library. And some of those quotes were so good. And I just thought that's why I put them on the front of, of, of each chapter. And the feedback from readers was everybody seemed to really like that. It, it added a little something extra. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that with the Wartime Book Club. And initially, I actually put on the top of each chapter, a real man or woman who had died at the hands of Nazi, in Nazi persecution. But reading it back, it was too complicated to digest. It, it it was worthy, but it didn't work in that place. So I actually put ended up putting all those at the back of the book. And then it was only when I was reading for research, and I didn't hadn't realised about that. I found this amazing book on eBay about um, books that the Nazis banned, so banned books, and it was just literally that a whole list of the of the titles that the Nazis felt were uncongenial to the regime. And there were some real shockers in there. I mean, obviously you'd expect Jewish authors, you know, communists, anybody that spoke out about the regime, but there was also a book in there, Bambi had been banned because obviously it was a Jewish author, but it Bambi's got its roots in a much darker story about anti-Semitism and persecution. And I was just, I was blown away by that. I never expected that book to be banned. So, and the more I realised, yeah, I thought there's loads out there actually. So it felt quite timely to put one on the top of each of each chapter. So I'd be really interested to hear what readers say about that, how how they found it, and um, and I think it tells a bigger story about 
the Third Reich and their weird ideology. Because there was a great story, actually, is it uh, Tolkien who wrote um, Lord of the Rings? He had been approached, his book came out just prior to, I think it was in the late 1930s, and he was approached by a German publisher who wanted to publish a German translation of uh, Lord of the Rings, but only if he could provide a letter proving his Aryan credentials, which was amazing. And he wrote back this absolutely stunning retort. He wrote back and said, uh, it's of no business of yours um, what my Aryan credentials are, and Hitler, Hitler is a ruddy little ignoramus. <laughs> I just thought that was such a great retort. So whilst that wasn't actually technically a banned book because it never made it into German, I thought that was too good not to put on there. <laughs> You've written a few books in the World War II era. Mm -hmm. What is it about that time period that you love so much and has you just keep coming back for it? There's something about World War II that's within our grasp, isn't it? It's recent history. There are still people around that can remember it. Everybody feels connected to some degree to the World War II because we've got you know, grandparents, hopefully some still alive if we're lucky that fought there. So, and I think it's something captivating about that time and putting ourselves in that position and thinking, what would we have done? How would we have behaved? What might we have done in that scenario? So I've always been fascinated by it. And I think there are just so many stories out there. I mean, when I first started writing World War II fiction in 2016, there were, well, certainly in England, there were World War II um, historical fiction, but nothing like on the scale we see it now. I mean, it's, you know, it's absolutely boomed, hasn't it? Um, and yet, for the all the fact that every week seems a new release of a historical fiction, there are still millions of, of stories out, untold stories out there. And that's where I work from the starting point that of what's the true story? How can I fictionalise it? What can I bring? What's what's new or surprising about the past? And there are always surprises in history. I've got a, a list of books waiting to be written of untold stories that I, you know, there's just not enough time to write them all. <laughs> the Wartime Library is already out in the UK where you are, and it's about, yes. to, as of the time of this recording, it's not quite out yet in the US. That's what's right, it like yeah. for you balancing these two different release dates for the same book? Well, it's not just that either, because it's it, then it comes out in Australia and New Zealand on a different date. And then, of course, then it, there are staggered um, releases because then it comes out in Spain and Italy and France and uh, Germany. And so then you I don't really feel like I have one set release date. It's just all year round now, which is great, actually, you know, because a book doesn't have a start and an end point. There's no defining moment when a book, you know, goes on sale and off sale as far as I'm concerned. It's just always out in the world. So I'm always getting emails from people like, you know, I had a book club in Brazil the other day. I did a Zoom with a book club in Girona in Spain. And I love that. I love that the, the book is a living, breathing thing going out into the world. And so I just don't see it as this is the date that this starts and that ends. It's just ever present. Are there any challenges you faced in putting your books out in multiple countries? Keeping up with correspondence, I would say. I get a lot of emails, particularly with the wartime library. It seemed to strike a chord, I think. And I was thinking about this, like why is the first of my books that have been translated abroad. Usually my previous books have just been in, in England. And suddenly now this went into all these different territories. And I just think it's because we all, there is a universal love of books and reading and literature. We, you know, it doesn't matter what language you speak. We all love the library. There are libraries in every country in the world, most countries in the world. Um, you know, they're the most civilised hallmark of a democracy, having a library. And I think that struck a chord in people. And so, you know what? It's it's not a job, is it? My God, I'm lucky to sit and and share these amazing stories and talk to people like yourself about them. That's just, that's a joy. I have nothing to moan about. So yeah, juggling hard. But then who, what woman isn't juggling? Ain't that the truth? <laughs> That was said with feeling. <laughs> um, so you have this line in there, in your book, that it stood out to me just because of the okay. use of dark romance right now here in the US. Uh, forbidden love seems desirable at 17, but it rarely ends well. Uh, kind of just talk <laughs> a little bit about the rise of forbidden love and it <laughs> being well, interesting guess... right now. Well, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, so many things from the past seem relevant. And I think that's the that's why I love writing about historic, you know, historical fiction or about the past, because actually you begin to realize that there is nothing new. Everything just comes around. We don't as humans, we don't learn anything from the past. We just often condemn to repeat the mistakes of the past. So 
Yeah, I mean, I was talking there, obviously, about a relationship between a German and a young Jersey woman. And that was a very forbidden, stigmatized relationship. But I tried to put myself in the in the shoes of a 17 year old girl in Jersey. You know, you're there. Um, your life's controlled by rationing and blackouts and the cinemas are closed and the dances are closed and the beaches are uh, you know all off limits and covered in barbed wire what have you got to do you know I remember what it was like to be 17 I just wanted to be going out having fun and then suddenly this young strapping man comes along and whisks you off your feet so yeah I think there were a lot of young women who thought that they were in inverted commas in love but they were just doing what young women have always done in history so that was that was the forbidden love and clearly in that scenario it didn't with it, well, no spoilers you'd have to read the book it didn't end particularly well <laughs> but that's what I meant by that I think it, and it's so you know that it, it's fascinating the way that women were treated in the in the aftermath of the war years especially um I think in areas that have under, lived through an occupation they tend to inject poison into the area into those places that have withstood occupation because when I was going back to the island you know what was it sort of 75 nearly 80 years on Women are still getting called jerry bags. And in fact, I was told this fascinating story by a tour guide who said that there was um, a woman who went, a very elderly woman who was sent to uh, to live in a care home. And when she walked into the communal lounge, everybody in the lounge deliberately turned their back on her. And it's because she was a jerry bag. No matter that that was 80 years ago, you know, memories are long and she was still an outcast all these years on. And it shows how toxic and poisonous those wartime relationships were and that that sort of moral quagmire that people were living in. And if you go around Jersey today, you know, you can still see very faintly on buildings and walls um, the outline of a tar swastika that was painted on the walls and the doors of anybody accused of collaboration with the Germans. And they've been whitewashed over, but you can still see them faintly underneath. And I love that as a sort of metaphor for, for history. It's always there lurking. You can't completely whitewash it. And you've mentioned a few times that you are a journalist. What did you learn from your journalism career that has helped you write fiction? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so the biggest thing I think I learned from being a journalist is my old editor said to me, when I first started out, she said, if there's a silence, don't fill it. She was like, just sit with the silence and you'll be amazed at what you hear. And I have tried to follow that through. And I think there's some truth in that. I think when you go out and interview people, um, quite often it's only at the end of the interview, this fascinating little nugget will slip out or and someone will say, oh, I didn't know where that came from. Um, <laughs> so that that's really helped. And I think also just about questioning and challenging and the past. I think in terms of research, it helps you to open more doors and to be more questioning about sources and to go to multiple sources and cross check and, you know, and, and just go and knock on people's doors and ask for interviews. I think that really has given me that skill that, you know, as a young journalist in my twenties training, I was always out on my patch as it was called back then door knocking, you know, you're expected to turn up a stranger's door where quite often they might've undergone the most, you know, horrific turbulent thing in their life and you have to turn up at the door and ask them to share their story with you that's not easy to do and I just did that all the time in my 20s and 30s and I think it helped me to understand how to 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 talk well actually how to listen not about talking it's about sitting and listening um active listening as well you know trying to read the subtext and and the story behind the story would you say I mean you're you're a journalist would you agree with that Oh, absolutely. Like you find people at the lowest point in their life. Yeah. Yeah. You have to try to get them to talk about it, even though that's something they don't want to talk about it. And it is, you kind of feel guilty about it too. Yes. Like yeah. Of, yeah. Like, I'm just doing my job and I know this sucks, but I need you to do this. And like the world needs you to tell your side. Yeah. It's really hard. You, it's, it's, you learn a myriad of skills without even realising it, I think, don't you, that, about how to, to empathise and how to get people to trust you as well. I mean, that's a huge thing. You know, and, and now journalists have quite a bad name in, well, in some quarters. So I think that, that adds to the challenge of it. But, there's, but, you know, there's still a place for good, robust, um, you know, investigative journalists now more than ever, I'd say. That's part of why I got out of news is it was just getting... So intense. Really? Yeah. What yeah, yeah, yeah. made it a very like 
we had a photographer get a gun pulled on him. We had another photographer get assaulted, oh. and they drove around the building all night while I was inside. And so it's like, wow, oh wow, that's so interesting. You say that, and do you feel like I feel? Um, look at me turning the tables. <laughs> you know, I'm asking you. Questions. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm amazed I lasted this long. <laughs> but um, I, I interviewed the other day for for my podcast this group of women, um, or not well, not just women, men as well, librarians in America called the Secret Society of Librarians, and they they remain anonymous. And they you should check them out. They're really interesting. And they and when I interviewed them anonymously they were saying how that they're just scared to go to work they're scared to do their job they get guns pulled on them outside libraries and because of the sent the rise in censorship and the anger um and the volatility they're really frightened to do their jobs which i found that you saying that about being a journalist really reminded me of that and about that rise of censorship which again harks back to what we're talking about with with world war ii we're just seeing you know nothing is new we're just seeing the same things rising up again it's a little creepy how it's yeah which so is similar to these historical stories yeah yeah and it so for me it feels quite zeitgeisty in a way to be talking about the censorship of books whilst you know and and you know you talk about you you immerse yourself in the past and you see you're oblivious to current affairs and then you know I'd be writing about this Nazi censorship and then I'd go downstairs and look on my phone and that somebody would be on Facebook talking about how the library had banned you know and um the diary of Anne Frank for example so it does feel like um, those themes, you know, that that anger, that that feeling of loss of control, it, it, it's kind of raising its head again all these years on. Uh, so you mentioned your podcast uh, mm. from the library with love. How did you go about getting started with that? What made you want to start doing the podcast? Well, yeah. So from the library with love is um, is a history lovers podcast. It's a as a podcast for people that love books as well. It came about because. I was interviewing as part of my research this incredible woman called um, Betty Webb, who was 100 years old, and she worked as a code breaker at Bletchley Park. And she is incredible. And I was sitting down opposite her recording her interview, and she had this really unique voice. Like, you don't hear voices like that anymore. You know, she wouldn't have been out of place in a Mary Poppins film, that particularly unique way of speaking. And, you know, it's great to be able to share her story in a book or in a magazine article or a newspaper, but I wanted people to hear her voice. And so then it, it suddenly occurred to me, look, I've recorded this interview. Why don't I think about releasing it as a, as a podcast? And, well, that's easier said than done, isn't it? It took me a while, you know, to really work out. And I'm still, you know, I'm still just fumbling my way through it, really. But so, I, yeah, I mean, to, to set up the name from the library with love and then to, you know, find a provider, a host, um, you know, a host for it and to work out how to do it and schedule them. And, do, you know, it's a whole, whole skill set of which I knew nothing about other than the fact that I just had this passionate belief that these are stories that need to be told and need to be heard. So what you'll find is a mix of authors sharing their stories, like, like I am with you, um, and also our wartime generation sharing their stories. So, and I try to coincide things. So like I have a, an amazing interview coming up with this guy called Mervyn Kerr. She's a hundred years old and he was one of the first men on the beaches at D-Day and telling his unique story and was there at the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. I mean, just incredible stories and so amazing to get his voice down and for people to be able to click that link and hear somebody from from that generation sharing their stories because in five years time I won't be able to do that you know there will be no more room or time left for lively reminiscing so I've got this very urgent sense of the need to capture those stories while whilst we still can I mean next week I'm going out to interview a a hundred year old woman called Ruth who I met that worked as a WAF in as a WAF so she was um picked up a spanner she said that you know I could have I could have done anything in World War II, but I really wanted to be a mechanic and it gave me the opportunity. And so I joined um, the RAF and worked as an aircraft engineer. So I'm really looking forward to interviewing her and, and sharing her story. So yeah, it's out there now on all the, the usual providers, Spotify, Apple, but it's called From the Library with Love. And I figured that, you know, it, it's it's about stories from writers. It's about stories from people that have books written about them. The library is the sort of repository of those stories. So that's why I called it that. And and it's my love of libraries. Very excited about that Bergen-Belsen liberator. 
In I a- know. I mean, he told, I mean, he tells an amazing story about how that there was a camp that had been liberated and his commanding officer asked for vi- volunteers to go in and help because they couldn't force anybody because there was a typhus epidemic. So you could only go if you were, um, if you want, if you wanted to volunteer and being Jewish, he, he didn't hesitate and he went straight in to help. And he said that in those early days, it was such a major catastrophe and humanitarian disaster that nobody really, in the early days, it was just unimaginable sights, but that he he started to gather up all his rations of chocolate and he would give them to survivors. And he said, only years later did I realise that was totally the wrong thing to do because it was way too rich for their bodies. And obviously a lot of people died after liberation from you know, for, from various different things, but but overfeeding was one of the things. So he told that story and he was really still gripped with shame about the whole thing. So just a fascinating man, an extraordinary man. So I'm so, I can't wait to share that story. Have you been to Bergen-Belsen modern day? Well, funny you should say that. I'm actually going next month. <laughs> I'm, it's I'm so going- cool. In like have you been way to say that <laughs> yeah no i know but it's but it yeah i can see it's lit you up so there's obviously a reason for that isn't there it's it's connecting you to the past I, i'm well, writing the buildings aren't there anymore so they know the ipad that with like geo locators so you hold the ipad up and it shows you where the buildings oh, would have been like really? so it's like an overlay and that's it's so cool that's so interesting. So yeah, lot in January I was in Auschwitz, Birkenau, in Poland. I'm actually I'm <clears throat> excuse me, I'm working with a, a Holocaust survivor at the moment to tell her story. And I'm retracing her footsteps, if you like, I'm, and the journey that into hell, really, that she took. And so in January I went to the Lodge Ghetto and to Auschwitz Birkenau. And then in uh, in May, I'm going to um Dachau, a subcamp of Dachau, and to Bergen Belsen. So I'll make sure to try and get that because because Rini's mother is is this is the lady whose book I'm writing. Her mother was very sadly one of the many thousands of people that didn't make it and died after liberation and is buried at Bergen Belsen, and she she managed to erect a small headstone to her there because obviously it was a mass grave. So I'll be going there trying to find her grave and and look around. So when did you go then? Was was that recent? Five, six years ago. Okay. Okay. The, uh, it's called RIAS, Radio in American Sector. Um, so it's a fellowship that takes American journalists to Germany and German Amer- journalists to America. And oh, wow. What an opportunity. So, uh, that was part of my research week where I was off on my own. because we I was in Kansas City at the time, and we had a woman who had survived Birkenau, Auschwitz, and Bergen-Belsen. And so she was oh. liberated from Bergen-Belsen, but shot in the process and oh. survived that. No way. She's oh. still alive, still kicking. They just made What's a her name? Her. Uh, Sonia. Sonia. So a movie called Big Sonia that's all about her. Is she still alive, this woman? Yeah, she's still alive. She? she just retired. She was a seamstress um, and just retired within the last year or so because, and only because they were kicking her out of the building where she'd been doing work. Oh, uh, yeah, they're made of tough stuff, these survivors. Yeah, so it's she's sure. she's would have still been working if they hadn't booted her out of her building but everybody know, knows big zonia in town do you know where she was before auschwitz because Rini, she must have followed a similar route to Rini, who was in the lodge ghetto then went to auschwitz i then am went to- not 100 percent sure i'll have to look her up though that's really yeah. interesting yeah because so, so i went i went to auschwitz and birkenau first then oh, did you? fellowship and then that was my research week was um Bergen Belsen, and then I was also doing stuff on Martin Luther because it was the 500th anniversary of the 95 Thesis. So I did a couple yeah. stories. Yeah, that's that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. I mean, it's a lot writing about about the Holocaust on its own without you know entering into that as well. But did you? I I there's no words to describe Auschwitz, is there? Once you've been inside the mm-hmm. you know the gas chambers and you've walked around Birkenau and you, the scale of it and and then and the knowledge that you're walking on. Jewish graves it's just it's overwhelming there's no way for the for the mind to process it is there it's so intense especially like Bergen-Belsen has like a museum as well and it's like the piles of shoes and the piles of glasses and it's just the oh, and the hair much, yes like all of that seeing all of that and walking yeah. around it's very heavy someone was like did you do anything fun in Europe and I was like not really. It's quite hard when you're because you, when you come out of those places, you just you need to lie down and just price and just try and understand. Your mind grapples with what it's seen, mm-hmm. and there's always isn't this? It's funny. There's always something, isn't there? Just one thing that 
that tends to jar. And for me, it was seeing the display cases of hair. And I remember going into this one thing room in Birkenau and seeing all the hair behind glass and and thinking, oh, wow, and it really drew me up short. But then realising that the glass display cabinet went all around this massive room. And I was just like my eyes were going around the room just thinking, oh, my God, it's everywhere. And I think it was like something like seven tonnes of human hair made its way out of Auschwitz. And and the sheer cynicism of it, the fact that they used to recycle it into bombs and, and mattresses and even socks for submariners, it's just, you know, that was what really lodged in my mind, I think, that de- as part of that dehumanisation, but that they could do that, recycle Jews into the Third Reich. It's just, oh. Uh, so you mentioned that you are working on a very special book. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what's up next for you? That is the book I'm working on, the... Um, the Holocaust uh, nonfiction book. Um, I can't say too much about that because I haven't had the all clear yet from my publisher to, to really talk about that. But that's that's very intense. That has to be finished by, I've got quite a tight deadline on that. And then after that, I'm going to go back to fiction. I think I feel after the intensity of that, that I will quite gladly go back to fiction. So I've got a few ideas bubbling under about what I'd like to do. Um, but one of which... We, we t- I talked earlier about the secret society of librarians who had banded together in sort of um, solidarity to fight censorship. And that really stru- sparked something in me, that that notion of women, of librarians coming together. And so I think I'm working on a, an idea that circles around the secret society of librarians. So maybe you and I will be talking in a, in a year or so or two years about that. <laughs> Do you feel like you approach fiction differently than you approach nonfiction? Oh, for sure. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, it's hard, actually, because when now I'm writing nonfiction, um, you almost like have to take off the fiction hat and put on the nonfiction hat because there are certain descriptions and that I would like to use, but I know I can't because they might not be accurate or appropriate or authentic so I try to rein back my um my prose I suppose and keep it more and it has to be more factual it has to be um and you have to just write completely differently so it can take a little while to get out of one zone and into the next but I'm kind of missing the creativity of or the creative writing having a bit more freedom to express yourself and write um sort of let yourself off the lead a bit and really go for it with with fiction. Um, whereas you're having to be much more constrained and concise and accurate in nonfiction. So yeah, they're very different disciplines. And I think it's really good to actually be able to go from one to the other because I think they feed back and they're complementary. I think the more research you do for nonfiction plays into how you approach fiction and your empathy and the the prose and the writing style of that can play back into nonfiction. So whilst you do approach them very differently and they're fundamentally very different disciplines, I think they both enable you to to use strengths and talents that play one into the other, if that makes sense. I think it does. It's like I've tried to write fiction, but I, like for journalism, you're like, no adjectives, no adjectives, no adjectives, because that's putting things in yes. a voice that might yes. be true to them. And so trying to write fiction, you have to use adjectives. And then it's like, yeah. I yeah, don't, I don't like this. <laughs> this <laughs> Whereas I love an funny. adjective, I can I can very happily um, use sit with adjectives all day long. The, the the challenge for me is to not use them too much in nonfiction. <laughs> it's like the I can't describe things too much because then that's putting putting too much out of my opinion, not the subject exactly opinion. exactly exactly. And in fiction, it's you have to make the subject's opinion, so it's. It's a it's a fun dichotomy to walk. Yeah, for sure. And I love that word dichotomy. How good is a word is that? It's a fun one. <laughs> a good word. You could use that in fiction and nonfiction. The last question we always ask, because this is literary hype, what books are you hyped about? So, oh, I have two books that I have just read that are coming up soon as new releases. Um, Janet Skessley and Charles, who wrote The Brilliant The Paris Library, has a new book coming out called Miss Morgan's Book Brigade, set in France in World War One. And Janet is just one of your dream authors. You know when like, you see an author's name and you just instantly relax, you know you're in safe hands. It's like slipping into a warm bath. She's such an accomplished storyteller. I knew that this book was going to be brilliant. Um, I wondered how she'd outdo the Paris Library, but she definitely has. This this is, an, is a gem. You should get her on actually to talk about it because um, the story of the librarians um, working in France 
during World War One, so close to the front line is astonishing. And she's done it justice. She really has. So I'm really loving that. I also am loving um, by Jill Poole, a novel called Scandalous Women. And it's a novel of Jackie Collins and the author of Valley of the Dolls. I think she's called Jackie, Jacqueline Susan. And it's, oh, it's just so good. It really took me back to growing up as a kid and reading Jackie Collins and just this women, these two incredible authors who were real strong feminists, like breaking new ground and selling millions of books in the in the process. You absolutely should get Jill Paul on to just I'm not doing it justice to describe it. She's she's so good at revisionist histories and looking at these two female authors and, and how they smashed glass ceilings. And it's just written with real verve and typical Jill Paul kind of style. So yeah, I'm loving those two books. So Scandalous Women and Miss Morgan's Book Brigade. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to literary <laughs> Oh, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you for having me on. It's been amazing, actually. And I've loved, like, it's really good being interviewed by a journalist. <laughs> you feel like you get a much more rigorous going over than you would otherwise. <laughs> so thank you for that. Thanks again to Kate for taking time out of her day to discuss her newest historical fiction, the wartime book club kind of touched a little bit on the little wartime library and we got a little sneak peek about her upcoming nonfiction project which i am very very excited to get my hands on if you enjoyed this conversation don't forget to like this video subscribe to the channel click that little bell next to it so you get notifications whenever i post a new author conversation and there are many more exciting conversations on the way you don't want to miss out thank you so much for watching i'll see you next time